In this video, we examine how the 802.11 protocols, commonly known as Wi-Fi, are designed. Let's get started. Now that we've spent some time looking at the differences between wireless links and wired links, and some of the challenges that that presents, we'll have a better understanding of some of the design decisions that are made for wireless link layers. We'll start by looking at 802.11 wireless LANs, which are commonly referred to as Wi-Fi or wireless ethernet. You can see a bit of a chronology here with 802.11b, the earliest version that was widely deployed for consumers, and was followed in a few years by 802.11g, which significantly increased the available bandwidth. Both of those protocols were only specified to run over 2.4 GHz. However, more recent versions have also been specified to run in the 5 GHz band. Today we commonly see 802.11ac deployments and are just starting to see 802.11ax, but in terms of product marketing, that is more commonly known as Wi-Fi 6. At the bottom of the table we also see the AF and AH variants, which are designed to work over significantly longer distances. And we can see that the trade-off there is that they have significantly lower speeds than the short-range versions that were developed around the same time. What all of these protocols have in common is that they use the CSMA CA algorithm that we discussed in the previous chapter. And while we commonly think of these running in infrastructure mode, meaning that there's designated base stations, there's also an ad hoc mode in the specification. So devices using these protocols can be configured to talk to one another directly when the use of a base station isn't feasible. In these networks, we use the term base station or access point interchangeably. And while we don't typically talk about cells in the case of wireless LANs, the equivalent concept exists, which is the BSS or basic service set. This includes the access point and all the hosts that are communicating with that particular access point. Hosts may be in range of multiple access points at once, and they will choose or be told which access point they should communicate with. And they also have the ability to roam from one access point to another on the same wireless network. Each of the available bands, 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz, have multiple channels available. So when the access point is configured, part of that configuration is choosing which channel within that band it should operate on. If two access points in range of each other are configured on the same channel, then they will interfere with one another. So it's important to survey the wireless environment and choose channels carefully so that neighboring access points do not conflict. When a new host arrives, it goes through an association process with a particular access point. To begin this process, the host scans through the available channels, listening for beacon frames, which are sent periodically by all of the 802.11 access points. The beacon frame contains both the SSID, which may be shared across multiple access points, but also the access point's MAC address, which is used by the host to differentiate one access point from another. Based on the beacon frames that it hears, it can choose which access point to associate with. The 802.11 specification also includes various forms of authentication, which may be required before the association is allowed to complete. Once the association happens, the host can then use DHCP just as it would on a wired LAN in order to get an IP address on this subnet. Let's look at the channel scanning process in a little more detail. This begins with the new host going into a listening mode and rotating through the channels. Once the host sees beacon frames from a network that it recognizes, it can send an association request and receive an association response. The first step of this can take a little time because while the host is listening on one channel for beacon frames, it may miss beacon frames that are sent out by nearby access points on other channels. There's an alternative to this, which is active scanning. In this case, when the host starts listening on a channel, it sends out a probe request, and then any access point on that channel will send a probe response, which contains the same information that would be included in a beacon. The association process is performed the same as in the passive case. All modern operating systems use the active scanning approach in order to speed up the association with wireless networks. However, it is important to note that there is a significant security vulnerability here in that the probe request contains a list of SSIDs that this host has connected to in the past. These are the ones that show up as networks the host remembers when looking at the wireless options menu. So a malicious access point can overhear this list of known SSIDs and send back a probe response pretending to be one of those SSIDs in order to trick the host into connecting to this rogue access point. The rogue access point is then in a position to perform man-in-the-middle attacks on that host's traffic. There are some mitigations to this, but that's beyond the scope of this course and is something we discuss in our wireless security class. As we've mentioned a couple times now, 802.11 uses the CSMA-CA algorithm so carrier sensing multiple access 
which means that if one node is transmitting, then all the other nodes should listen and not start transmitting at the same time. And as we've also mentioned, this mechanism is susceptible to the hidden terminal problem. Not all nodes may be able to hear the transmissions of every other node in the network. Also, this is CSMA CA, not CD. In wired Ethernet, we had CSMA CD, which was carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. However, in the wireless environment, it's technically very challenging to sense collisions as they happen. So there's no collision detection in wireless. Instead, we have collision avoidance, CSMA slash CA. So let's see how that works. First, we have a specified time for listening on the channel before a beginning transmission, which is called DIFFS. DIFFS stands for the DCS interframe space, where DCS is distributed coordination function. If no other transmission is detected during DIFFS, the data frame is transmitted in its entirety. Remember, we can't sense collisions in wireless, so there's no reason that a transmitter would stop before transmitting the entire frame. If instead the channel is already in use during the DIFFS period, then the transmitter will wait and start a random backoffs timer before it starts sensing again. This is similar to other randomized backoff processes that we've seen, because if the channel were in use and multiple other transmitters were sensing the channel, and they began their diffs period as soon as the transmission stopped, then they would all sense that the channel was idle, but they would all begin transmitting at exactly the same time, causing collisions. So instead of transmitting as soon as possible when the channel is idle, they have to wait this random backoff period so that hopefully only one host will begin transmitting at a time and the others will sense that transmission and not collide with it. On the receiver side, the data frame is received and it's acknowledged. And this acknowledgement happens after SIFS, the short interframe space. So this is how the sender knows that no collision happened. If they don't receive the ACK, the frame will have to be retransmitted. SIFS is much shorter than DIFFS, so if there is an ACK to be sent, it will happen before it's possible for any DIFFS period to expire. So the ACK will be the next packet sent on the channel after a frame is received successfully. This CSMACA algorithm works well as long as there aren't too many hosts trying to share the channel. However, we can employ an additional mechanism, known as RTS-CTS, for more heavily congested channels. The idea here is that the channel is reserved by the sender first sending a request to send, which is just a small control packet, and the base station broadcasts out which host is allowed to use the channel next and for how long. So while the hidden terminal problem means some hosts may not hear other hosts' transmissions of the RTS, by definition, they're in range of the base station, so they will hear the CTS that the base station sends out, and they will know not to transmit, and thus avoid collisions while the sender transmits data. The RTS control messages may still collide with one another, however, they're small, so they waste a minimal amount of bandwidth. This way, after the CTS has expired, meaning the source has sent their data frame, other hosts will know how long to wait, and then they can send their own RTSs to reserve the channel if they need to send data. Now let's see the RTS-CTS exchange. In this case, hosts A and B both send RTSs at approximately the same time, and they collide. This means that the base station is not able to interpret these transmissions, and so no clear to send is issued. After random backoff, A retries first with their RTS, and while we're showing that this RTS doesn't reach B due to attenuation, the base station transmit the clear to send, and so B knows not to transmit during the specified time. So it defers its transmission, and A now has the channel to transmit their data frame. When that frame arrives at the access point, it transmits the acknowledgement, and so A knows that there was no collision and the transmission was received correctly. Now we can look at the 802.11 header format. Probably the most noteworthy thing about the 802.11 frame relative to other headers that we've looked at is that there are four addresses. This allows us to include addresses on the wired link, as well as addresses that might be important on a wired segment that is part of the same IP subnet. Remember, our layer two MAC addresses have significance throughout the broadcast domain, and these wireless one hop links may be part of a larger ethernet broadcast environment. So our first MAC address is the destination of this transmission, meaning it's either the wireless host or the access point. And the second address is the sender of this transmission, again, either the wireless host or the access point. The third address is the subnet gateway address. So if this frame ultimately needs to get to a router or other host on the wired network, the access point will know what MAC address to use as the destination and send it on. Then there is space for a fourth address, which is used in ad hoc mode. Because in ad hoc mode, we have multi-hop wireless transmissions happening. And so we need to differentiate between the sender and receiver of the frame on a given link and the sender and the receiver within the entire subnet. 
Let's look at an example of this addressing. We have H1 transmitting a frame to the access point, and since we're in infrastructure mode, we're using only the first three addresses. So the destination of this wireless transmission is the access point's MAC address, and the sender is H1's MAC address. However, within this subnet, the destination is the router's gateway address, so the R1 MAC address is used in the third address field. That way, when the wireless access point needs to construct the wired Ethernet header, it knows what MAC address to use in the destination field. So here's our 802.3 header with just two MAC addresses, which would consist of the source host's MAC address and the router interface MAC address, just like we would normally see in an all-wired Ethernet environment. We also have a duration field. This is used in the RTS-CTS exchange. And we have a sequence number. Remember, these data frames get acknowledged. So the sequence number is used to match up acknowledgments with transmissions. We also have two bytes of frame control, which gives us a number of bytes to specify things like the version of the protocol, whether or not encryption is being used on the link, whether or not this is a retry, if it's fragmented, whether the frame is destined to the access point or coming from the access point, as well as types and subtypes of the messages, which can differentiate between control frames and data frames, with control frames being the RTS, CTS, and ACK frames that we've just been talking about. We also mentioned that mobility can happen between access points. And because this is handled in the layer two environment, it's transparent from an IP perspective. So we have two basic service sets that are participating in the same wireless network and host H1 is transitioning from one access point to another, probably because it moved closer to the second access point, so the signal is stronger there. Then the question is, how do the Ethernet frames from the router get to the correct access point? And the answer is, it's the same self-learning process that we saw before with wired Ethernet switches. So if I were to unplug a host from one switch and plug it into a different switch, all the switches would self-learn where that MAC address now lived. The same thing happens in the wireless environment. When the H1 MAC address moves from one access point to the other, those frames start coming from the new access point and the switch updates its switch table accordingly. We also mentioned the importance of rate adaptation in the wireless environment. And that's something implemented in the 802.11 protocol. If the SNR is high, then the base station and host will negotiate a high encoding rate that allows for increased bandwidth on the link. However, if the SNR degrades, they will also downgrade the encoding accordingly to function with reduced SNR. So in this example, we have the host moving away from the base station, which is causing the bit error rate to increase. As the bit error rate increases, this would cause increased retransmissions in 802.11, which significantly degrades the channel's efficiency. So when the bit error rate gets too high, the base station will switch to a lower coding rate that has a reduced bit error rate. Another important feature of 802.11 is power management. Since many of the wireless devices are also battery powered, and the radio can consume a significant portion of that device's overall energy, this can have a significant impact on battery life. Basically, a wireless node is able to let the access point know that it's going to turn off the radio until the next beacon frame. So the access point won't transmit any frames that it has for that particular node until the next beacon frame. The wireless host will wake up and receive the beacon frame, and in that beacon frame will be a list of all of the wireless devices that have frames waiting for them at the access point. So if this particular node is on that list, it will then stay awake and wait for the access point to transmit its frames. Covering an even smaller geographic area than local area networks, we have personal area networks, the most common of which being Bluetooth. These are basically designed to reduce the amount of cables needed for convenience or comfort. They are ad hoc in the sense that there is no dedicated base station. However, there is a designated controller for each Bluetooth network, and the rest of the devices operate in client mode. These also share the 2.7 GHz band, so they can interfere with or be interfered with by 802.11 protocols. And they use a polling scheme, so the controller polls the clients to see if they have something to send. To combat the issue of interference, an FDM approach is used. So the devices hop from channel to channel, and while they may collide with other transmissions on some slots and channels, most of the slots should be non-interfering. Also, because we're talking about even smaller battery-powered devices in most cases, energy management is very important in these environments. And Bluetooth handles this with a parked mode, so clients can effectively go to sleep if they are not transmitting or receiving. With that, we've covered 802.11 LANs, or wireless ethernet. In the next video, we'll move on to looking at cellular environments, which have a number of features in common with wireless LANs, but also some significant differences. See you then! 
We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell. Thank you.